We're headed to Costa Rica in Central America, a country that is known for its extraordinary biodiversity. In fact, over 25% of the land is now protected, and tourists from around the world come to visit the country to enjoy its wonderful ecology. Framed by the Caribbean to the east and the Pacific to the west, Costa Rica is located between Nicaragua and Panama. Its lush forests are home to one of the last big cats of the Americas, the jaguar. This mythical animal has suffered from habitat fragmentation and the continual reduction of its hunting territory. The jaguar's troubled coexistence with humans now threatens the very future of the species. The team heads to the highlands of Costa Rica, to a private reserve in the Talamanca region. In this protected area, scientists can study the jaguar's behavior. The farm also hosts aboriginal families who are rediscovering their roots and an old harmony with nature. The team is meeting with scientists Jan Schipper and Jose Gonzalez of the Sierra to Sea Institute. Jose is a jaguar specialist and knows the reserve very well. Jaguar is probably one of the most amazing animals in, in, in America. This is one of the last big predators we have. Only pumas share the same, you know, like the same ecology and niche. Uh, it's their third largest cat in the world. And, um, well, it can go from 30 kilos up to 100, 120. They can live around in the wild around 20 years. Uh, there are some cases reported of, you know, like longer. But uh, usually they die before because they get old and it's difficult for them to hunt. Jaguars exist as a symbol for wild. It's a symbol that we still have places where big predators can exist and prey base can exist. Genetic studies have shown that jaguars actually belong to a single family, extending from Argentina to Mexico. However, as forests continue to shrink, jaguar populations are increasingly confined to isolated pockets, small areas that are often not connected by migration corridors. We have identified so far in the farm 12 different individuals. It's a, a big concentration because there's no hunting, uh, there's a good prey base, we have all the mammal assemblage, entire complete mammal assemblage. And um, so this is probably a shelter, a good shelter for them. So it's what, what we call in, in population biology a, a source population. So animals, you know, breed here, produce here, and they move out and colonize other areas. So right now we're going to um, where we set up the, the trap and uh, one snare and a couple camera traps. It's in the middle of the forest and the road is not very good, so, so it's gonna take a little while and hopefully not many raining. It's pretty hard to drive. Whoa. We saw this morning some fresh tracks, so I, I think we have really good chances, but obviously these are really, really smart animals, so well, you, you never know, you know, it's, it's a matter of luck. Hopefully we'll, we'll get there anymore. The biologists hope to capture a jaguar. They want to install a satellite transmitter that would tell them about how the jaguars make use of their territory. We use some pheromones to attract the animals, and we set them in these small sticks all the way, so like pointing at the, at the trap. And you can see the two cameras right over here. Oh, yeah. Right oh, yeah, the cameras too, here and here. Oh. And oh. this is the trap. So it, it has a little mechanism, like, right in the bottom. It's just like a small table. If the animal steps on it, this gate just falls down. Yeah. We're going to check it right now, just to see if it's... Working fine. Ay, ay, ay. These little cameras here detect heat and motion. So anytime something warm passes in front of the camera, it will take a picture. These will work day and night, and they can take video and still images. 
Okay, so we've got a couple of different kinds of baits here to choose from. Uh, what we've put on this one so far is the fat cat predator bait. Uh, these are pheromones mixed with some urine and other things that we can use to try and bring the cat in. And the cats like them. The well, they like. we don't know if they like it, but they're attracted to it. This attracts a lot of other things too. We don't just get cats. We'll get okay. bees, as you can see, insects, butterflies are very attracted to this. Even other mammals, like tapirs. Other mammals. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> it's something really different, and they're not used to these strong smells. Yep. So it's just something to attract animals in general. Yeah. Okay, what we're going to do now is just take a little bit of this other pheromone, which has a little bit more scent, scent to it. It's a little bit stronger. <laughs> yeah. And we're going to apply it here to the side of the tree. This way we can disperse the scent across the trail a little bit better. I can use a stick to sort of put it wherever I want, but this moss holds the scent nicely, even if it rains. So I can just take a little bit of this and just apply it on to the side of here and spread it out just a little bit. So I think we're gonna use this place here. It's narrow, we can close it. There's a couple bakery entrances around. I think it's gonna be perfect. This is to create a natural path for Natural him. path, yeah. He's not gonna jump over there. He's just looking for the easiest way. So, Jose, what are the chances that we catch one? I think we have great chances. Um, the place is, is great. I mean, this road, it's used lots of time by the Jaguars and Pumas. The place is really safe. There's only one path. So I think we have great chances. It's a great place, not harm for the animal. So it's, it's probably fine. With jaguars, it's like a game of hide and seek. Once you are there, you need to erase all traces because they can detect us from afar. They are very cunning animals. During his years tracking jaguars of the reserve, Jose has managed to photo identify many animals. He can now recognize them by the different pigmentation patterns of their fur. Approximately 6% of jaguars are melanistic, or all black. These are often called panthers. Cameras installed on trees allow biologists to photograph other animals of the forest as well, such as pumas or even the jaguar's prey. All this data is essential because observing a jaguar in the wild is rare. Sometimes the videos captured by these cameras are simply astonishing. Oh, look at that. Oh my What's God. This? What is that? Is that a cow? That's definitely a cow, and that looks like Cora. Yeah, that's Cora. Amazing. <laughs> this <laughs> is amazing. Cora. That cow's probably been dead for at least two or three days. You can see by all the flies and the entrails coming out. Yeah. You don't see that every day. No. <laughs> These images are rare and valuable, <laughs> but they also demonstrate the problems of coexistence between cattle farmers and forest predators, like the jaguar. Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. That's amazing. Look at that. That's a big jaguar. Look at that. I see the string in his Look at that. mouth. Wow. And there she goes. Oh, <laughs> amazing. That is awesome. That's great. That is awesome. To avoid possible injury to an animal, it is important to check the traps every four hours, day or night. Ready? Yep. Capturing a jaguar is certainly not a simple task. They are very cunning animals, but, but we are patient. Nothing, eh? Nothing. Oh, 
but wait a second. Look at that. Hey guys. There's a track. Oh yeah. Let's try to look for more, probably more tracks. Careful stepping over. Yeah. yeah. Chaps right here. Oh, there's another track over here. Looks like he came in this way and went right up to the trap and right over it. Oh, yeah. We missed. It's really frustrating because it's days we've been trying. We thought we were getting anywhere, and then we saw that there was a track just nearby, and we missed out. So close. Ah, that was close. I mean, this! Look at that. Converting forest into agricultural land causes a significant loss of jaguar habitat. Less forested areas means less prey for forest predators such as the jaguar. So it is not surprising to see big cats attacking livestock. Coexistence between jaguars and livestock farmers has become a serious issue for the conservation of large forest predators. Actually, to work really hard with people, and we need to work on agricultural landscapes, and you know, like all the private lands, because we need areas where the animals can move between protected areas with no harm, no causing conflict, not getting hunt. We have passed the paradigm of working only in protected areas. Now we need to focus on the areas that are not protected but are critical. Yeah. The team has decided to widen its search area. Jose and Jan want to investigate every part of the farm to study the movement of the jaguars. Yeah, this is perfect place. Ah, oh, look at there, look at there. Oh, yeah. Wow. Some jaguar marks. Wow, even there. All the way up. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a good spot for jaguars. This is a perfect spot. Yeah. yeah, this is the place where she'll set up the camera. Hold there, please. Yep. So usually we use this height because we can catch pretty much any mammal that comes in front of it. Um, we always use this shady area so we don't get sunlight direct to it. Historically, the native peoples lived within the Jaguar Range for, for hundreds of thousands of years without a whole lot of problems. As populations of humans expanded, the parks sort of had to draw the lines and put fences up, and that's been the major problem. If you just fence these parks off, it's just not enough area, and you can't especially in an area as small as Costa Rica. Even 25% of the nation put in some kind of protection just isn't enough because you have little blocks of habitat all over, none of which are really big enough to support jaguar. Yes, I think seeing the farm from the air will give you a very good perspective of, of the work we're trying to do. It is the biggest uh, private forest reserve in Costa Rica held by one person. Over 25,000 acres. Wow. Yeah, you see the, the border of the farm, you see? That goes for many, you know, 20 some kilometers that way. So from here, everything to the right is the challenge that we face. Everything to the right here is what we need to talk about in terms of connectivity. You can see there's only little patches here and there of forest with agriculture, uh, clear-cut areas for, for cattle and so forth. So each one of those has a sort of value system in terms of what use they can be for animals to go through. Pastures obviously has very little value in terms of a jaguar being able to cross. But some of these agroforestry areas you can see here, which is a mix of trees and sustainable agriculture types, is actually something a jaguar will pass through. So we don't necessarily need a continuous virgin forest from here to the coast. We just need a mix of forest types along with different types of more sustainable agriculture to connect it. You know, that's a lot easier to sell that to landowners instead of saying, oh, we need to take your land away and put it yep. in conservation. What we need to do is teach people better ways to manage their land so that all the different species can survive here together. Yeah.
The problems of the rainforest are not only caused by deforestation, there are a host of other factors. For example, in the neighboring country, Panama, the habitats are also threatened. Panama is known for its famous canal, which allows ships from around the world to pass quickly between the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans. Globalization and shipping are responsible for the ever-increasing spread of invasive foreign species. The arrival of a new animal, bacteria, or even fungus can often seriously upset the balance in ecosystems. For example, in Panama, frogs are disappearing. A mysterious microscopic fungus has invaded the country and is quickly killing off many of the rainforest's amphibians. The golden frog is the emblem of Panama, but you won't find any in the wild. It is now considered extinct, and only a handful of survivors remain in captivity. Biologist Edgardo Griffith is trying to understand the strange disease affecting Panama's amphibians. The team accompanied him to a river that he has studied extensively. This is like prime golden frog habitat. This is like a very good breeding area because it's fast moving water. The first time I came to this stream was in 2003. And I was impressed with so many frogs and large numbers of them. So in a way to me sometimes was like, how can they you know, all manage to be in such a small stream and be successful and eat and, and breed in here? But it was just so many. I could spend hours, 10, 12 hours, just sitting, getting recordings of the vocalization. The water, the stream, you know, especially like in quiet pools, the whole bottom of the stream was moving because it was just loaded with tadpoles, you know. And, and by seeing that, you knew that it was a healthy environment. <laughs> and then what happened? At the end of 2005, beginning of 2006, we knew about this fungus that was moving from the, the west, coming, you know, eastward. And we knew that it was going to get here. And uh, we, we anticipated that it was going to arrive around 2007, but the fungus arrived in 2006. The kirtid fungus arrived in Panama in 2006, and it was devastating. Frogs started dying at an alarming rate, and scientists were powerless to stop it. Some scientists believe that the fungus dates back to the 1930s and 40s, when a species of African frog, Xenopus levis, was used to develop pregnancy tests. At the time, scientists found that hormones in the urine of pregnant women caused egg laying in the species. It was an important and promising scientific discovery and Xenopus levis was sent to laboratories around the world. Though it's self-resistant to the disease, the frog was a carrier of the chytrid fungus. So the fungal pathogen was spread around the world. It mutated to a new form and invaded much of the tropical rainforest, killing most of the amphibians in its path. Found mostly in wetlands, the fungus acts like a sealant on amphibian skin. Because amphibians breathe partly through their skin, the chytrid fungus causes a series of metabolic problems. Eventually, the frog suffocates and dies. Some have survived, but many species have gone extinct. Today, the disease continues to wreak havoc around the world. And unfortunately, there are no effective cures for the epidemic. It's crazy when you think about it. Edgardo has already identified 56 species of frogs in this simple little stream. Today, finding one is a challenge. And the golden frog of Panama, the very emblem of the country, is considered extinct everywhere in the wild. The fungus kill 90% of the amphibian community, and in some cases, 100% of the individuals of certain species 
came, kill, stay, and at the same time, moving. It's moving eastward uh, towards the Darien or towards Colombia, but it's also coming up from South America. You cut the sound of the stream, few insects. I mean, it's really quiet. It's extremely quiet. For somebody that's been here before, to knows how noisy this stream was, frog wise, it's, it's remarkable not to be able to, to hear them, you know? And um, it's just, you know, it gets you. It gets you, and uh, it's not just the feeling of you know, then you know that the frogs are, are missing, but to know that they're missing is, is, is really sad, actually. And, you know, a lot of us goes away when the frogs are disappearing, you know, and I don't want people to feel that way. In this tree, I found what I call the last golden frog two years ago. It was at night, and she was sleeping up there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The animals that are left have no opportunity if we don't take them out of their environment and put them in, in captivity. And for as ugly as that sounds, it's, it's the only option. But if somebody can come up with a, another solution, I would be more than willing to try. La captivity, captivity is the only option for the moment. So they built small, sterile laboratories where they housed the last forest specimens. It's a little crazy. Everything must be sterilized when you enter the lab, because just on the other side of the door is the fungus ready to kill. And it's also crazy at the same time to think that we've had to build modern Noah's arcs to save the last living examples of a species from the devastation brought on by humans. The reason why we had to build this center was to reduce the risk of extinction of certain species of amphibians that were being affected by a fungal disease. So the only option for us was to go to the field and collect um, most of the time sick animals and we brought them here and we apply treatments uh, to help them get rid of a fungus. And the goal of this facility is to, you know, keep as many as we can in captivity until we can bring them uh, to where they belong. Some of the animals that we have here uh, are the last of their kind. The last, they represent what's still alive of one particular species from around this area. Sad enough, you know. I'm a biologist. I used to be a field biologist. Uh, now I think I'm like an extinction biologist. As you see here, we have a lot of tanks, hundreds of tanks, and within those tanks, we have hundreds of plants and rocks. And one of our biggest challenge here is to make sure that the fungus that we know that's right outside that door doesn't get in here. So we have to disinfect constantly everything that comes into the facility to make sure that that fungus stays out there and not in this facility. The center in Panama City could be seen somehow as a Noah's Ark. Back then was God's will. Nowadays what's happening is because we are causing it. So we are the ones that have to come up with ideas, with Noah's Ark, and make sure that we bring those animals to where they belong, because they don't belong to a, to a facility. They belong to this stream, you know. The team scours the riverbanks for hours without finding a single frog. In the face of such carnage, scientists can do nothing. For the moment, they have no solution. They are merely trying to gain time, making every effort to capture and save the last individuals able to resist the disease. 
There's one. But it's a daunting task. This is a male, so my Aliska Saiwa. And this is a species of tree frog. So normally, we don't find them during the day like it was here or like in the stream, you know. You normally find them on the side, you know, side pools and bank, in the bank. But uh, this animal, I don't think it's in a, you know, 100% in a healthy site because a healthy frog of this species will be trying to escape, to run away yeah. in a very energetic way. Like, you know, he will, they're really strong based on, you know, according to the size. Some of these animals might have a heavy infection and they still survive. So after more than five hours, he's the only one that we found. That's how bad it is, you know. Five years ago, we probably already seen, you know, a couple hundred, three, four hundred frogs in, you know, the 200 meters that we have walked. And uh, it's how bad it is. It's how empty this place is, you know, one single guy. Could you see some effect already, you know, into that ecosystem? Well, yes, you know, first of all, in the water, you see a lot more algae growing over the rocks. And also, there are a lot of, there are a lot of, uh, uh, parasites and and mosquitoes and things that can easily transmit diseases diseases that we don't even know that they yeah. exist yet because amphibians were there to keep all these things in check in a way so the entire uh, equilibrium is broken it's, it's totally broken it's compromised and you know but by saying this I'm not saying that it's too late because if we come together because I know we can yeah. To find a solution, I think that not just amphibians will be back, but everything else is related to the amphibians, including the forest. Some regions, such as the lowlands of Panama, are less affected by the chytrid fungus. For scientists like Roberto Ibales, it is important to focus research in these areas to try and understand why some species are more resistant than others. We arrived at the river at dusk and started our trek. We began to hear frogs, and it was, it was a sign of hope for us. Of course, we didn't hear much, but already it was very encouraging. Issue with it. That is a glass frog, and it's a male that is calling and has a ma uh, egg mass. Just oh, yeah. Year. The males guard the eggs once they are laid on, on the leaves. That's a tree frog. It's a tree frog, yes. But they are called grass, glass frogs because you can see the bones through their skin and the internal organs. At present, this fungi is found not only in the highlands, but also in the lowlands of Panama. Yet, we don't know much about what is happening with the amphibian populations in the lowlands. This is a very interesting species because in places that are already infected or that have declined, you still find this species around. So this one might be one of the species that we need to focus more mm -hmm. into it and see why is there so bad, you know. And even though this is not endangered species, it's important to do this kind of surveys because it tells us if we have this fungus around this area. She might be infected, but she's not sick. Yeah. You know? 
Alright, now we're gonna let this little guy go. The export of organisms is a problem all over the world. And we know this because it isn't the first time we hear of it. Often organisms that are introduced into new areas become vehicles for pathogens or potential pathogens, harming the ecosystems into which they are introduced. One morning at Edgardo's research center, the news was not very good. A specimen of a very rare species had died of an unknown cause. Obviously, captivity is not an ideal solution, but right now it is the only one scientists have found. You know what happened? <clears throat> Atinda, because she was gravid and we didn't have, we didn't put a female in the tank. You know, the eggs got bad. We used to have three of these species, or at least uh, three animals that looked similar that were collected in the same uh, stream. So this is a big, you know, uh, loss for us. What we're going to do is try to get as much information from this animal as possible that we can use to make sure that the other two that we have uh, stay alive and with us. And if they turn out to be a new species, they will be even more important than they are right now. We don't have a cure for this fungus. We can cure the animals once we, let's say, I come here, I find a frog, I collect the frog, then I go to the lab and I give a treatment to that frog to help the frog to get rid of the fungus. So, voila, yes, the frog is cured. But if I bring that frog back here, she will get reinfected and die. It's a fact. We've seen it many times. They are important. They are as important as an elephant, as a, as a tiger, as a, you know, the white shark. They all have a role in the environment and they all belong to a place and they are all part of something. So we need to make sure that amphibians continue doing the dirty job for us. But I think there is still some hope. For example, in Costa Rica, where we work with jaguars, a species of frog is defying the prognostics of science. One day, in the Talamanca Reserve, a child came up to Jose. In his hands, he held a strange little frog he had found near the river. The scientists were astonished. Here are some marks. So that's the site? Yeah. We have found a couple here, so we probably may be luck. There, there, there. Wow. It's a beautiful little frog. Do you know when they discovered the fungus around here? Yeah, actually, the last time, it was 17 years ago. When they discovered this population, there was already declining, and they reported, actually, the extinction and disappearance of the frog in the river. And that's where they discovered the fungus here. It is officially recorded as uh, 16 here and in all Costa Rica right now. Do we know why this population is resilient? That's exactly what we're studying right now, actually. Um, this is a unique opportunity because we don't know if it's resilient or if it's tolerant. Maybe the fungus also changed. So this is like a live laboratory to study amphibian decline and why this population is recovery as in many other parts that they disappear and they're gone. So this frog, in a way, is bringing lots of hope. It is, it is lots of hope because if this one is recovering, there's hope for other species in, in the country and in the neotropics to be recovering. And also this part is really important in amphibian diversity. So that means that if we found this population, probably, eventually, and hopefully we're gonna find other species that were totally and considered extinct in Costa Rica. The rainforest is threatened from all sides, but I think it is important to understand the critical role played by each link of the food chain, each species in its ecosystem. The jaguar, for example, is what one would call an umbrella species, in that they control other populations that interact within the same ecosystem. The role of the jaguar is very important, just like that of the frog. Bad news? Nothing. Nothing. 
<laughs> we checked all the traps again. Well, that's life, I suppose. Yep, we're obviously very concerned about what might be causing this. Um, we're looking into it. I think the, the next steps for us are to put out some more camera traps and just re-survey the entire area because we know how many individuals there are and which ones are around. We can actually go back and see which ones are missing from the population and maybe do an estimate of, of what's happened. Yeah. Even if we have all this conservation momentum behind us, it can just take a few people to come in and, and maybe snare some animals, which is what we're hearing, maybe using some of the bear snares that they use in the U.S. that are, that are kill traps. Hmm. It's depressing. That's sad. It's the reality we live in. Yeah. yeah. Tracks. No tracks are on. We didn't see signs. We were on trails in an area we've been working for five years with very positive signs for jaguar and puma and a lot of their prey. We had no signs whatsoever that they were jaguar in that area. And, and because that's the low part of the farm that borders with the outside world, we're very concerned that maybe poachers have been coming in there and using some illegal snares to kill the jaguar. It's early morning in the small village of the reserve, and the people are on alert. Rumors are circulating that poachers may have come into the reserve. Everyone lends a hand. Every effort must be made to protect the jaguars. We actually have a picture here. Oh this is a picture God. that came off of Facebook. Oh, that's sad. It's a shame. I mean, they're really rare, and, and this was just for fun, you know. And these are young kids. I mean, look how young they are. These, these are the people we need to be reaching out to to make sure that the next generation doesn't grow up like the one that yeah. we currently face. Yeah. Yeah. They can be teaching their parents, but I think if we can get convince them that this is a problem and that they shouldn't be taking pride in posting pictures like this on Facebook, that maybe we can, we can change the future for these species. A private militia is preparing to go hunting for poachers. Here, conservation measures are not just expressed with words. It's actually kind of worrying because uh, there are some rumors of heavy poaching and hunting in the area and uh, in general in the country recently so many jaguar deaths and uh, unfortunately that could be affecting the animals and the population in general. Uh, it's something really worrying and, and we need to find out what's happening with the population. The farm has had anywhere between 9 to 16 armed guards protecting the borders during night and day, and they've done a really good job at keeping out the poachers. It's a reality that we have to face, because if we don't do that, then we're going to suffer from the syndrome that the park suffers from, and that's this repeat poachers coming in over and over again and removing the animals from the park. On one side, we have this paradigm of having a set-aside reserves. But I don't think that's going to be the future of, of our planet. Setting aside reserves and parks that don't allow people to go in there is nice, and I think it's, it's, it has to be done in some areas. But we really need to start thinking out how to get these 9 million people into the forest so they can appreciate what's going on outside of the cities. How are you? I know of at least three jaguars that have been killed just outside the property. They've been confirmed, but there are actually rumors of 11. That's a lot. Recently, there seems to be a growing business for jaguar skins. So we're trying to find out who is behind it. I was telling Fernando how sad I am, because it's as if they were threatening members of my own family. I don't know what we'll do with these hunters. It worries us. It's really frustrating. So many years of work, of love, of sacrifices, just to witness our jaguars being killed. The introduction of invasive species, 
deforestation, loss of habitat, the menaces to the tropical forest are numerous, and quite frankly, we may be running out of time. There's no time to feel sad about this situation because that's not going to fix anything. I think we can work together mainly for the animals, but also for future generations. So when they look back, they'll say, yeah, those guys knew that it was a problem and they came up with a solution and they will be thankful for that. I'm optimistic because I believe we can change things and if, if, if people and, and you know human being realizes the importance, there's still something we can do, but we are right on the edge. If we protect jaguars, that means that we can protect the vast majority of biodiversity. Fortunately, everywhere on the planet, there are scientists who are organizing to protect habitats. And I think we should heed them more, because these men and women really dedicate their lives to saving the planet's biodiversity, and they are all saying the same thing. If we organize, we are capable of great things. But it is important that we act, and that we act now.